In the fog-filled alleys of Victorian London, amidst the soot-stained brick, the light of gas lamps flicker, haunting the night with shadows, creating phantoms dark as pitch. By 1838, rumors of ghosts and devils reported in villages beyond the bustling city have now breached London, and the alleys teem with whispers of spring-heeled Jack. With red eyes and breath of blue flame, he tears at his victims with metal claws, then vanishes into the night. And nearly two centuries later, the mystery remains unsolved. Join us as we comb through the history and attempt to separate the fake from folklore to uncover the reality behind London's first real urban legend, Springheeled Jack. <laughs> Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. jury. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Feldman. magicians are demons, specters, and spirits, spooks. summonings, paralysis, strange disappearances, sky whale phenomena, yes. alternative history, shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello, you clowns. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Insulting right away. <laughs> well, it was from the show. Yeah, that's right. That was from before. No, we were, we just watched a funny little clip on YouTube called Ha Ha You Clowns. It was strange. Well, hi. Welcome to Believe Hole. Welcome to be here. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. I'm Chris. And we are the brothers here in the hole to welcome you to this exciting, bizarre episode today on Spring Heeled Jack. Oh, yeah. Got to go back in time. Yes. Spring Heeled Jack, this has been on our radar for... Well, since the beginning of the show, but it's just something we just never covered. Yeah, I've wanted to do it for a long time. This legendary, phantasmic figure of the Victorian London streets always haunted me, in a way, since I first heard about it. I think years ago on Clyde Lewis, actually. Oh, wow. Ground Zero. Great show. But yeah, it's one of those um, iconic figments in supernatural legends and lore that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to dig into this. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of digging through old newspapers. Sign up for a couple of newspaper archives online and you had to get close to the sources yeah. as possible. So John will be excited. Definitely would be a shocking thing to have happened to you back then. Uh, yeah. A run in? Yeah. What's a run in with this guy like? Or a thing? Well, that's the thing. But before we dive in to this enigmatic figure of Victorian England folklore, expansion members, you should know that as of this episode drop, you will now receive all of our main episodes ad free within the expansion rss feed so if right now you're subscribed to the expansion and you get those downloaded to your phone inserted in between those episodes will now be ad free versions of the main episodes finally so you don't have to do a thing you don't have to switch between podcasts or podcast apps you can just continue listening to the belief hole so if you're thinking about joining the expansion to get all of this amazing extra content that we've built up over the last five years you also now get the full immersion belief hole experience of the main episode. Ad free. That's right. Awesome. Jeremy, break down this enigmatic figure for us. Spring Heel Jack. Okay, so imagine yourself in the streets of 19th century London, Victorian London. Imagine yourself there, a labyrinth of narrow, winding streets, shrouded in a perpetual cloak of fog and soot. You know, this is a time when there's a, a burgeoning industrial revolution happening. Yeah, a lot of new stuff on the horizon. Feels similar to today with the AI revolution, in a way. Except more smoke yeah. and cogs and gears. And Steampunky. Yeah. Steampunky, yeah. So in this kind of setting, this contrast of poverty and tight-packed buildings of downtown London where people are a lot of people living in squalor, you also have the astonishing achievements of industry, steam engines, telegraphs, changing the, the very rhythm of life in London. Yeah, this is crazy because at this point in time, these new mechanized miracles 
created a middle class for the first time. Right. Because you had these elite aristocrats and then you had people pretty much in poverty, the servant class. The basic class system. But now people could afford things like carpet and wallpaper for the first time. So is this like the beginning of the industrial age? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mass production. In Britain specifically, we're talking about, um, yeah, you would have like uh, factories where they had industrial looms, where you had yarn or whatever fabric they were using to loom, whatever you loom. Uh, and they'd be going through the, the air, these giant strings with these machines that are looming like, you know, uh, fabrics, textiles, I don't know, sweaters, whatever you loom, uh, blankets, but things that... Socks. Socks, for sure. But eventually, <laughs> but you used to, it would just be, yeah, people that had wealth or class that had access to these kinds of things that they were handmade. Now with the Industrial Revolution, you had a middle class. It was building a middle class. Building yeah. a middle class of people that could afford these things that were originally just for the upper crust, if you will. So it was a weird time. Everyone was getting access to these things. Kind of like now with, even if you're, you know, homeless, you have a smartphone. It's kind of like that weird mm -hmm. parallel. But at this time, it's still strange because specifically at this time, this is before Edison, Tesla, before the electric light. So you'd have gas lamps casting a dim glow with flickering light, creating dancing shadows along the, the grimy brick walls of the alleyways of downtown London. I'm feeling immersed. I am feeling immersed right now. So it was a strange time, and there was both the awe of this industrial age and these new things, but also the imagination of what that could bring, and also the apprehension of change and what's going on. I feel it now. Right? I feel like in that type of environment, everything would feel uneasy. Yeah. Because you're already in a dark kind of place. Exactly. And that's kind of the place where demons lie. Anything unknown would be kind of scary. Right. It creates that atmosphere of fear. And who likes fear? Fear eaters. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's, is there fear eaters in this episode? Uh, that's exactly what. What? Spring Hill Jack is. No, that's an argument that could be made. Well, I'm putting him directly in that category. Whether he's a phantom or a prankster. Oh, I thought this was for sure like a real human being. Well, that is kind of the, the mainstream argument. And I would say I lean in that direction with caveats, but he still is someone who is feeding off of the fear. There's still this yeah. pleasure, this like a psycho desire. Yeah. Psycho. Psychopath. Path. Exactly. He's a real human fear eater. But there are several theories of what he or it was. And we're going to talk about that towards the end of the episode because there's some pretty interesting and bizarre things to talk about. Consider. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're in London. We kind of outlined it, my basic level of research, what it might have been like. But you're in this mysterious, uneasy time in the winding alleys of downtown London. And you might see phantoms. It's the perfect atmosphere for figures to dart between the rooftops and the shadows created by the lamps and the, the fog and mist. And frequently, people would see these things. In fact, there is a history of phantoms and phantasmic lore in London and the outskirts of London. Yeah, predating Spring Hill Jack, right? That's right. Jack was not born in a vacuum. He didn't just appear on the scene. His genesis, I believe, is connected, and through a lot of researchers that we'll talk about in this, point to the villages or outcroppings just outside of London where they've had a history of these, what some might refer to as prankster ghosts. Most villagers believe there were people dressing up, uh, but they were people exhibiting, in some cases, alleged abilities like jumping 10 feet, being 10 feet tall, being able to jump half a building, like I think was uh, the Southampton ghost or the, um, the Hammersmith ghost. But these all existed just before Jack got on the scene. And the question remains, I think, could Jack be the same guy or thing? Or is it just part of the tradition? Because there were reports of this four months earlier before we, we see the name Spring Hill Jack in the papers. There were reports outside of town. And we'll get into some of that. Wasn't Jack the Ripper in this part of the world London. too? London, Whitechapel. Yeah, not, not much later, I believe. Are they it was the same person? Potentially. Wasn't it 100 years later? Uh, 1888. So actually, between August 31st and November 9th, 1888, which is interesting because... One of the final accounts connected to Spring Hill Jack that I have in here, I think, is from 1888, the very year that Jack the Ripper appears. He just accelerated his violence. Ooh, that's kind of interesting, actually. Yeah. Because of what you read that story, actually. That's uh, coming uh, out. What, what? John makes the connection. <laughs> Connecting the <laughs> nodes the of truth one. over here. Nice, John. <laughs> Ding. That's what happens when you know nothing about anything. <laughs> that's good. You get the bird's eye view. There you go. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the atmosphere dark characters can emerge. We've built the atmosphere. And what is the spectacular aspects of Jack that make him so stand outy in history? Because there are a few. Yes. That seem to be not of that time. Yeah, as you'll hear in the accounts coming up, there's uh, a handful of attributes of Jack 
that make him unique. And I think there are specific attributes where, unlike the phantoms and the ghosts or the ghost pranksters of Hammersmith and Southampton, which we will hear from coming up, unlike those that you can definitely say are pranksters, there's something unique to Jack, Springheel Jack. Obviously, besides his namesake, the, uh, the leaping, which isn't necessarily unique, but I think specifically the blue balls of fire. Oh, yeah. That's definitely an interesting... Barf from his mouth, right? Vomited. Yeah. Spewed. So that's coming up in the stories, but these attributes uh, that make him this phantasmic figure, uh, extreme agility, being able to leap over walls and... Metal claws. Super steampunky. Super steampunky. Yeah, we have the kind of uh, superhero, supervillain-like attributes of Spring Hill Jack, um, which is actually really interesting. We'll talk about that, that are not necessarily unique the leaping and the all these kinds of things. It's the mechanization. It's stuff. the mechanization. Alleged, alleged mechanization. This apparatus that is seen on his chest that some refer to as a kind of lamp. This ability to blow this fire, this plasma or whatever it is from his mouth. Does he like have a workshop, you think, that he does all this <laughs> stuff? See, that's my theory. We'll get to the theories later on, but I'm I definitely lean more towards the kind of mad inventor. Yeah. The Victorian Batman. Um, so all that's coming up. That's kind of the basic attributes of this figure that appears and terrorizes the town. But I want to do this now because the phantasmic attacks of Jack, spring Jack, first began to really appear in London newspapers in December, which is when this episode drops. Oh, yeah. So it is timely. So when you picture that place in London, in Victorian London years ago, picture it snowing a little. Wreaths upon the doors. Oh, and one other aspect besides the, the devil-like characters, imp, the more strange descriptions is one of a helmet. Yeah, which is very odd. And actually, Bob Gimlin, who we'll link in the show notes, great creator on YouTube, did a really good video, and he kind of leans into this attribute of how it was extremely hard to describe or to make depictions of Spring Hill Jack. Because all the depictions you see are basically devil-like gentlemen of the time, (laughs) with tights leaping from buildings. But a lot of descriptions aren't really captured. Yeah, the illustrations don't at all reflect the actual descriptions that people gave. like The helmet and the oil skin. They didn't have words for control panel and, you know, uh, where the lamp would be. Right. Anyways, we're just going to put a link to to that, but it's really, really interesting. There's a lot of ways you can look at this and it's been interpreted to death in the literature. So many different ways you can go with research. And one of the aspects of the research, when you're looking at old accounts of Spring Hill Jack, who kind of came on the scene December, 1837, you run into this issue. uh, And this is kind of a disclaimer I want to put out there for anyone looking into this. The research into Spring Hill Jack I think specifically more than anything I've looked into, is wrought with fake lore. Ooh, I like that term. Yeah, and I learned... Did you make that up? No, uh, it comes from a 1950s author. I forget his name. The term fake lore was coined in 1950 by American folklorist Richard M. Dorson in his article, Folklore and Fake Lore, published in the American Mercury. But um, I heard the word first from Mike Dash, who actually did a really good research paper on Spring Hill Jack and exposed some of the stuff. So just, just for a quick example, some of the pitfalls. One example is uh, an encounter I want to include Mary Stevens from October 1837 in Clapham Common, but that reporting is sketchy. There's not a lot of contemporary sources. I couldn't find any contemporary sources, newspaper sources. About her? Yeah, sources of the time. About her encounter? About her at all. And then Polly Adams, who's supposedly a servant girl who was attacked, is another story. And apparently, according to Mike Dash, was completely invented by another author. But it's really interesting because this is a perfect example of creepypasta existing kind of before creepypasta. Victorian creepypasta. Yeah. Well, Al Dente. He wrote his book, I think, in the 90s, early 2000s. But, oh. um, but there are quotes like this where he refers to Polly Adams having a, quote, good figure and a twinkle in her hazel eyes, which where would mm. you get that information? Uh, <laughs> and then specifically when it comes to the story of Lucy Scales, which you're familiar with, John. We're going to cover her story. Yeah. Um, just little little kind of giveaway lines like, uh, Lucy had walked purposely up the street with Margaret, her sister, who you can't find a name for anywhere in the newspaper accounts, skipping behind playing hopscotch. And then at some point she brushed some strands of her long blonde hair out of her eyes and took a few steps forward. Little details that like, there's no diary entry, like no one witnessed this. from. That doesn't necessarily mean that the account is completely fabricated. People exactly. do that a lot. No, you know, very true. Part of artistic license. But I guess the main point is there is nowhere in the original newspaper accounts where this happened. And when Mike Dash followed up with him, I found this in one of his little footnotes. He asked the guy, he's like, I'm trying to find where you got the story of Polly. It's a really great story. Where did you get the source? Can I see the source? And the guy says, the author says, quote, I'm afraid that all my research material for the book was ill-advisedly as it has transpired loaned to a scriptwriter who was planning a film around the character 
This was some years ago, and all my efforts to trace and all my efforts to trace him subsequently have proved as elusive as the subject of the story himself. Meaning Spring Hill Jack. In other mm-hmm. words, you lost it all. He accidentally allegedly lost it by giving it to the the scriptwriter or something. So, anyways, it's possible. That's just to say that this is. It's really hard to like figure out because there's so much stuff that's been repeated online and on blogs. And if you're not looking actually at the newspaper accounts, you're not going to know it's real. And of course, he became a kind of a superhero in, in the Penny Dreadfuls, the early comic book style writings. Yeah. So they wrote a bunch of fictional stuff shortly after this. Within several decades, he became this, you know. So you do do you have any newspaper accounts of this? Yes. Everything we're going to be reading is from the, from the newspaper. Oh, even, I thought you just said the one with... Um, Lucy Scales? Yeah. That's right out of the paper. Oh. Yeah. So he was saying the version that that guy had was exaggerated. Oh, so the, they're the same. It's just a different version. For that one. Yeah. For Lucy Scales story, uh-huh. he exaggerated that with details that oh. he couldn't have known. And then the other stories can't be found anywhere. I gotcha. Yeah. Like the Polly, Polly servant girl, girl. Anyway, so be careful out there. But in our show notes, we will have links to every newspaper source that we used. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see them pop up on screen. So extra fun. Like and subscribe. Don't be late. Well, do you want to start off with potentially the most famous account? Yes. There's a storyline here, um, a timeline of how these events occurred in the papers and in the awareness of the Victorian Londonites, if that's what you would call them. Uh, But I think it would be behoove us to go right to, I think, the stories that are most most connected with the lore and the most uh, corroborated and widely accounted for in the papers of the time. The first one, I would argue, is Jack's attack on Jane Alsop. Now, this account was recorded in the Times from February 22nd, 1838. And I I think this might be the first time or one of the first times that we see in print the moniker Spring-Heeled Jack, the Suburban Ghost, which is a great title. So on the evening of Tuesday, February 20th, he attacks a girl by the name of Jane at Bearbinder Cottage, Bearbinder Lane, on the outskirts of the village of Old Ford. The following day, Jane goes with her father and her two sisters who were there to report the attack to Lambeth Street Police Office. And this is the account straight from the Times, February 22nd, 1838. At about a quarter to nine o'clock, Miss Jane Alsop heard a violent ring at the gate at the front of the house. And upon going to the door to see what was the matter, she saw a man standing outside of whom she inquired what was the matter and requested he would not ring so loud. The person instantly replied that he was a policeman and said, For God's sakes, bring me a light, for we have caught spring Jack here in the lane. She returned into the house and brought a candle and handed it to the person who appeared enveloped in a long cloak and whom she at first really believed to be a policeman. The instant she had done so, however, he threw off his outer garment, and applying the lighted candle to his breast, presented a most hideous and frightful appearance, and vomited forth a quantity of blue and white flames from his mouth, and his eyes resembled red balls of fire. Frozen in fright, she was able to observe that he wore a large helmet, and his outfit which appeared to fit him very tight, seemed to her to resemble white oil skin. Without uttering a sentence, he darted at her. And catching her partly by her dress and the back part of her neck, placed her head under one of his arms and commenced tearing her gown with his claws, which she was certain were of some metallic substance. She screamed out as loud as she could for help and by considerable exertion got away from her and ran towards the house to get in. Her assailant, however, followed her and caught her on the steps leading to the door when he again used considerable violence, tore her neck and arms with his claws as well as a quantity of hair from her head. Finally, she was rescued from his grasp by one of her sisters. In talking to the Lambeth Street Police, Miss Alsop added that she had suffered considerably all night from the shock she had sustained and was then in extreme pain, both from the injury done to her arm 
and the wounds and scratches inflicted by the miscreant about her shoulders and neck with claws or hands. Miss Mary Alsip, a younger sister, said that on hearing the screams of her sister, Jane, she went to the door and saw a figure, as above described, attacking her sister. She was so alarmed at his appearance that she was afraid to approach or render any assistance. Mrs. Harrison said that hearing the screams of both her sisters, first of Jane and then of Mary, she ran to the door and found the person before described in the act of dragging her sister Jane down the stone steps from the door with considerable violence. Mrs. Harrison got hold of her sister and by some other means or other she could scarce describe, succeeded in getting her inside the door and closing it. At this time, her sister's dress was nearly torn off her. Both her combs dragged out of her head, as well as a quantity of hair torn away. The fellow, notwithstanding the outrage he had committed, knocked loudly two or three times at the door, and it was only on their calling loudly for the police from the upper window that he left the place. I mean, intense. It surprised me because I didn't realize how violent some of these attacks are. Because you yeah. read the the summaries in the newspapers of the times, and you don't catch all the details of how violent. And yeah, it's kind of been cartoonified in my brain. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially with bit. the depictions of like, Hoo-hoo. yeah, right, <laughs> the little cape. But yeah, he, he was an aggressive man. Yeah. yeah, or thing or being. At least, and this is kind of an important yeah. point. This story and the story we're about to tell next, which I think is kind of the mo- the uh, next most agreed upon event that is from the Spring Hill Jack, because there were many Im- imposters, it seems like, after the fact, and different kind of pranksters leading up before. But this was a very specific guy, because not only were the these kind of iron talon attacks, claw, like very violent kind of attacks, there were also specifically these blue flames. Right. So it seems like this is a singular guy, at least in these couple of instances. When you have the pattern, the characteristics that you can, yeah, connect. Right. It's interesting, because I did read somewhere that this was the first recorded example where you had copycats in crime. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. You had people start after Jack's. Like, dude, that guy's so cool. <laughs> I mean, it's such a catchy name, too. Spring Heel Jack. Do you know why they named him that? Because of his... This is an interesting question, yeah. because we kept going through the concept, like, where is the, the sprint, where is the jumping, the high heights? Because it is in the later yeah. examples, but there is a newspaper account that refers to him this way, so there must be an account. Well, I don't know if you found that. Jack? Like, Jack, I think, was just an, a moniker you give, like, uh, Jack and Jill, like J- Jack the Ripper. It's just Jack is like a, a Joe, a regular Joe, or John Doe, or something. yeah. I think I read something about why specifically Jack. Um, it's like Jack O'Lantern, the guy who walked around the forest after the deal with the devil that carries. Just a very common name. It's just a yeah filler name. Maybe like Johnny here, like Johnny Buffalo or Johnny Johnny Be Good, Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, John, there's better examples. I can't think of any. But yeah, the Spring Hill. So is that a thing? The Spring Hill part. Yeah. So. I do remember talking about that very early on in the show. Yeah. Because I did a little sound boingy thing. Boing. Well, it's never <laughs> actually seen that it, that he had a spring. The sort of the assumption was that was the technology they could understand at the time. He must have springs because of how high he can jump. Oh, so this gets back to, is he a real man or is he some sort of a phantom or, thing? Yeah, yeah. Or is he, my favorite theory, a time traveler? Here we go. I will convince you by the end of the episode. <laughs> That's Chris, by the way. Why? Okay. Oh, you'll yeah, just hang on for that. But as for that question, John, it's a good question because when I was getting these stories together for the episode and, and making sure they were corroborated with contemporary accounts, which I, by the way, contemporary, I always thought meant like modern, like contemporary music. Like today's time? I guess contemporary means, and I'm dumb because I didn't know this, contemporary means of the time. I thought contemporary meant modern too. Well, it makes sense of the time, of, the time. of wherever you're at. Exactly. So in this case, contemporary reports. It is modern for wherever you are. It's true. But when I was reading like, first I was reading this and I was saying like, Looking at the contemporary reports and accounts, we're like, why are you looking at contemporary writings when... It means of the Victorian but it means era. the ones from the papers at the time. Anyways, but looking at that and trying to gather the stories that were actually reported in papers, and it wasn't made up fiction later, that was later applied as attributes to Jack, which some of the attributes of Jack we know now in popular lore are, they've been applied after the fact because people have written books or, or the Penny Dreadful kind of graphic novels yeah. stories. Um, the accounts, the genesis we're going to explore of Spring Hill Jack shortly the Southampton ghost and specifically the uh, Hammersmith ghost. These are characters that were reported on and specifically using the phrase the ghost after referencing Hammersmith, which is like a village outside London right before Jack comes on the scene. These are referenced at the mayor's 
meetings, I guess, essentially there was a, the Lord mayor, the Lord mayor, yes, who receives a letter and he reads it to the people and it goes out to the press. And that's when we first start hearing of the concerns outside of London before Jack makes it here. Yeah. And in those letters, in that one specific letter, uh, and the following one where the newspaper responds to it, they mention the leaping of the, of this ghost, but they don't, I don't think at that point they say Spring Hill Jack. We'll yet. get to that. You're jumping ahead. Okay. You're leaping ahead. But that was to the question. Yeah. Like, does he leap? But these two accounts, the one we're about to read next, it's uh, surprisingly devoid of the leaping. There's more of a scampering and a, a quickness. A skipping. A skipping, if you will. Scampering is, sounds like something a fucking it would do. It's skipping doesn't? <laughs> no, scampering. It sounds, yeah, it sounds like what the depictions of him would do. It's like tra la 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 la. Ooh. Tiptoe to the tulips. <laughs> He's kind of a bit of a, of a coward, I'd say. I mean, he attacks mostly women and older people. And children. And children. Yeah, I mean, you got to have some balls to, to do it, anything like that. And the interesting motivation is alleged about this, John, which I don't know if I'm familiar with yet, but this is, this will be an interesting conversation coming up here when we get to the Lord Mayor's letter. Okay. Well, yeah, it's important to note that Jane was kind of an upper crust girl. Uh, I forget what her father was, Mr. Alsop. He might've been a lawyer or something, but they were kind of in the upper echelon, the upper crust near Kensington Palace in London. Because like you said, that would take balls because you're going into places where there yeah, are consequences right. to that kind of thing. It's probably was a violent era too. Well, you're liable to get blunder busted. Oh yeah, you'd be killed, strung up. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were some, definitely people clamoring for oh, yeah. exact revenge. Mm -hmm. Hanging. For disrupting the, uh, what do they call it? Like basically the, the, peace? Uh, the peace and the sensibilities of the ladies. Yeah. Like there's such a vulnerability built into the, the language that they use then that like basically she was so shocked that she was bedridden almost to death and people apparently have died of fear. I don't know if people were just very scared back then. Well, you don't, I mean, especially blowing fire from the mouth. Well, that specifically, but there's even just like run-ins and grabbed by this ghost, oh, okay. you know, where the lady died shortly Let's after. Let's get to it. We're going to oh, get weird. to all this. Anyways, but it makes me wonder if it's how they believe women to be, or if it was specifically like maybe the girdles. <laughs> there's some, you can't get enough breath. Anyways, you'll see as we get into this. <laughs> Speaking of skipping and scampering, we're going to skip the uh, story, which you guys might come across of a servant boy at two Turner street, because that, in some accounts, is the next account of the three... In the timeline? The three kind of official accounts of this Jack. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, confusion about that timeline. It's been very sensationalized. Seems like some people distrust the, the account at all. So we're moving ahead from that short account to, I think, the next most important account, which is when Jack strikes again. And the victim, Lucy Scales. The attack of Lucy Scales. And this takes place, depending on where you're looking, either two days previous and wasn't brought up until after because she's the daughter of a of a butcher, so kind of a lower class figure, or it took place eight days later on February 28th, 1938. Mr. Scales, a respectable butcher residing on Narrow Street, Limehouse, accompanied by his sister, a young woman 18 years of age, made the following statement relative to the further gambles of spring -Heeled Jack. Miss Scales stated that on the evening of Wednesday last, at about half past eight o'clock, as she and her sister were returning from the house of their brother, and while passing along Green Dragon Alley, they observed some person standing in an angle in the passage. She was ahead of her sister at the time, and just as she came up to the person, who was enveloped in a large cloak, he spurted a quantity of blue flame right in her face. <laughs> which deprived her of her sight and so alarmed her that she instantly dropped to the ground and was seized with violent fits, which continued for several hours. Mr. Scales said on the evening in question, a few minutes after his sisters had left the house, he heard the loud screams of one of them and on running up on Green Dragon Alley, he found his sister Lucy, who had just given her statement on the ground in a fit and his other sister endeavoring to hold and support her. She was taken home, and he then learned from his other sister what had happened. She described the person to be of tall, thin, and gentlemanly appearance, enveloped in a large cloak, and carried in front of his person a small lamp, or bullseye, similar to those in possession of the police. The individual did not utter a word, nor did he attempt to lay hands on them, but walked away in an instant. Every effort was subsequently made by the police to discover the author of these and similar outrages, and several persons were taken up and underwent lengthened examinations, but were finally set free, 
nothing being elicited to connect with the crimes. After this time, however, the attacks appear to have been discontinued. So there again, you have the blue flame. Yeah. The fireballs spewed in the face. They didn't mention the red eyes in that one, did they? I don't think so. That's a weird detail. Again, with yeah, when it comes to the red eyes and the helmet and the... That's definitely more of a spirit, like a phantom type Or thing. is it more of like, it sounds science fiction-y too. A helmet with glowing eyes and a blue respirator kind of thing. Was the helmet on the first story? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is, right? Frozen in fright, she was able to observe that he wore a large helmet in his outfit, which that appeared... That was the first story? Yeah, with the white oil skin. Attacks. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Gimlin, the guy you mentioned earlier, the great researcher on YouTube storyteller but he had his illustrator do what a real depiction of this would look like had they had the terminology and if you really break it down by how they described it it basically looks like darth vader with a cape a helmet the respirator with the blue gas coming out yeah. and the red eyes and the apparatus on the chest the apparatus control panel on the chest really and the metal claws i mean it looks like superhero suit super villain yeah that's an interpretation from obviously our lens right our time yeah but yeah th- it's interesting there because that's when you hear more description about that lantern on the chest or whatever it is that's attached. Sounds like it's affixed to his chest. Because remember in the first story when Jane is asked to get a candle because we've caught Jack in the lane and he takes the candle and puts it to his breast. And it sounds like to me that whatever he's igniting there, whatever apparatus or a kind of... Um, it's like a pilot light on an oven? Exactly. A kind of uh, augmented lantern of sorts that allows him to blow this blue fire. Is this an exhaust for the, the power supply that allows him to leap? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's crazy, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if we need the leaping aspect to kind of exemplify all the attributes we're hearing here of this kind of elaborate, early supervillain-esque kind of prankster character, if that's what he was, if not a phantom of some sort of supernatural sort. But if your theory is incorrect, Chris, and that lantern that's ignited by that candle does not power his jumping, then what do you, what would power that kind of phantasmic superhero-like leaps? What energy? Oh, I, you know, I know. If you were fueled by HelloFresh. Ah, yes. Clean, healthy food. Clean, healthy food that gives you energy. Yes! That's a great point, actually, Jeremy, because this episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Yum, yum. Yes, sir. I was going to say yum, yum. John beat you to it. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm actually really excited to try some HelloFresh. You know, I did try it. Did you? I did. When was that? This was years ago at a friend's house, and they, I watched the unboxing. Super exciting. <laughs> Ooh, glorious. And unboxing. it was absolutely delicious. Do you know what it was? I don't. No. Oh. But we, we are excited to get our package in the mail. I just took a perusal of the website and saw the dishes. I didn't realize how kind of, uh, what was the word you used? Zazzy. Zazzy they are. Yeah. They look fresh. They're very relatable, but they all have like a spin that looks really Yum, yum. They look kind of gourmet in a sense, but also like, you know, you can make them at home. And I like that they cater to different diets. I used to be a pescatarian back in the day, just fish. And a vegan. Yeah, and we were raw. We had all kinds of diets, but I saw that they cater to whatever your dietary needs might be. Uh So you can get a plan where it gets, by the way, it's fresh food, we should say, delivered to your door. Yeah. So you're working a busy day like Spring Hill Jack might be in his dungeon, his laboratory. Working on a steampunk invention. Right, his, uh, what do you call him? His bouncies? <laughs> his little bouncy juice? That, you know, life takes energy and time, and I know my biggest problem is just making time, because we're always working on the show. Yeah. To just get to the store, figure out what you're going to make, and then you find yourself at Taco Bell at 3 a.m., and you're like, what have I done? I made a terrible mistake. This is the opposite of that. It's a great way to eat a balanced full meal without having to break down and get fast food. Exactly. And my favorite thing about HelloFresh is one of the things that I hate about cooking is... You know, you're at the store and you need to get all these different spices and ingredients and stuff just to make one dish. And then you're left with a bunch of extra. Exactly. Stuff you may never use again. So you get pre-packaged, perfectly portioned. That's awesome. Ingredients. Waste not, want not. You don't end up with a jar of cardamom in your pantry two years later. (laughs) Saffron. So go to HelloFresh.com slash BeliefHoleFree and use code BeliefHoleFree for free breakfast for life. Oh, that's for life. Cool. One breakfast item per box while the, your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash free with code BeliefHoleFree. And that link will be in the show notes. Get it. HelloFresh. Why it's America's, America's number one meal, meal kit. kit. <laughs> <laughs> that felt very much like Ghostbusters. <laughs> 
<laughs> what was their tagline in Ghostbusters? Something about we'll believe you. Are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? Have you or any of your family ever seen a spook, specter, or ghost? If the answer is yes, then don't wait another minute. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. Go Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. We're ready to believe you. Well, now that we've learned how Spring Hill Jack eats, yeah, let's talk about some of his. Uh, let's talk about some of the spotlight that was placed upon Jack before these accounts we've just read previously entered the kind of mainstream London papers. The initial account, yes, of Jack or uh, whisperings, musings, rumors of the Spring Hill Jacks around London town in the outskirts came in the form of a letter to the Lord Mayor that was read by the Lord Mayor. I think his name, what was his name? Uh, Sir John Cowan? Yeah. Something to that effect? They basically received a complaint. Yes, a concern from a constituent, if you will. I don't know, did they vote? No, I don't think so. A a commoner. A uh, subservient. Subservient. Had written a letter and was very upset. And you'll see why. But this was, yeah, this was the, technically the first published account. It was the published account of the Lord Mayor reading to the audience outside of his mansion estate, right? To the press yeah, and to the so crowd. It's called the Mansion House. And this was a place where the uh, Lord Mayor, basically the mayor in charge of London, uh, would read concerns of the day or have dialogue with the press and the people, from what I can tell. There'll be a picture in the show notes of what this place looks like. But there is... The mansion house. Here's a picture. It'll be in the show notes, guys. Pretty stately place. Fancy. And if you look at the top there, there's an addition. That's what was called the the mayor's nest. <laughs> I guess he lived there at the he time. He lived there? It is the mansion house. I'm not sure if he lived there or not, but... That's uh, where he nested. That's where he nested. And I think they still... The mayor of London still uses this today, I believe. Interesting. But anyways, uh, yeah, place to hear grievances and, and concerns of the day. And of course, on this day, January 9th, so before the February attack on Jane that we heard first... This was a month earlier. The musings, the concerns of this rabble rouser, this, I think the suggestion was these pranksters involved in these kinds of uh, deviant attacks before we had the actual official Spring Hill Jack attack. My lord, the writer presumes that your lordship will kindly overlook the liberty he has taken in addressing a few lines on a subject which, within the last few weeks, has caused much alarming sensation in the neighboring villages within three or four miles of London. It appears that some individuals of, as the writer believes, the higher ranks of life, have laid a wager with a mischievous and foolhardy companion, name as yet unknown, that he dare not take upon himself the task of visiting many of the villages near London in three different disguises, a ghost, a bear, and a devil. And, moreover, that he will not dare to enter gentlemen's gardens for the purpose of alarming the inmates of the house. The wager has, however, been accepted, and the unmanly villain has succeeded in depriving seven ladies of their senses. At one house, he rung the bell. And on the servant coming to open the door, This worse than brute stood in no less dreadful figure than a specter clad most perfectly. The consequence was that the poor girl immediately swooned and has never from the moment been in her senses. But on seeing any man screams out most violently, take him away. There are two ladies which your lordship will regret to hear who have husbands and children and who are not expected to recover but likely to become burdens to their families. For fear that your lordship might imagine that the writer exaggerates, he will refrain from mentioning other cases, if anything, more melancholy than those he has already related. This affair has now been going on for some time, and, strange to say, the papers are still silent on the subject. This writer is very unwilling to be unjust towards any man, but he has reason to believe that they have the whole story at their finger ends, but through interested motives are induced to remain silent. It is, however, high time that such detestable nuisance should be put a stop to, and the writer feels assured that your lordship, as the chief magistrate of London, will take great pleasure in exerting your power to bring the villain to justice. I remain your lordship's most humble servant, a resident of Peckham. 
So basically, that's all to say that this person who'd written the letter, who, by the way, the Lord Mayor thought was actually a woman pretending to be a man. Oh, right, because of the penmanship? Because of the, the beautiful handwriting, he said, was very uh, feminine handwriting in, in his eyes. But uh, basically, she was concerned because no one was taking this seriously. And she was alleging a conspiracy that people knew. People in power, people in the press especially, knew that these things were going on and no one was doing anything about it. So this was the first publication of these sort of reminiscent Jack uh, attacks. Yes. Jack attacks. Jack attacks. Well, and that kind of goes to the accusation at the time because of the class system. Aristocracy. That there was this feeling of the aristocrats, aristocrat kids can do whatever they want and get away with it and no one really cares. Like the, That's one of the arguments of why Jack later wasn't caught was because they knew who he was and he wasn't punished and had the resources to abscond. Yeah, and if you happen to miss that, in that letter, basically what they were alleging was that there was a group of aristocrat men, young men, who had dared each other to go and do this and that there was a secret that was to be kept and it was basically go around and terrorize these women, you know, kind of a, you know, an elitist wager to terrify people. Basically a way to get their rocks off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a way that when you're rich and you need to keep pushing the envelope sometimes, I guess. And maybe eventually become Jack the Ripper. They're like, how far can I go? Yeah. It's like the limbo. It's violent limbo. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is key. It goes on uh, the newspaper account, not the letter itself, but the newspaper account that reported the letter. According to that article, the Lord Mayor went on to say, quote, if any trick had been practiced by fools, he had no doubt that the vigilance of the police might be depended upon to prevent annoyance, end quote. And the article concludes by saying, but as the terrible vision has not entered the city, he could not take cognizance of any iniquities. Basically, it's out of his jurisdiction. Yeah. So he's got no power. Like, I think the police are going to handle it out in the villages. It's not in my territory, so good luck. And this is the part that sounds specifically like what would come to be known as the characteristics of a Spring Hill Jack. The article goes on to say that at some point, a gentleman called out to his lordship that servant girls in Kensington, Hammersmith, and Ealing told, quote, dreadful stories of the ghost or devil who, on one occasion, was said to have beaten a blacksmith and torn his flesh with iron claws. Ooh. So this is the first account of the iron claw thing. Uh, it's important because it comes up again later, too. And this is before the actual connection with who we know as Spring Hill Jack. It happened a month later, before he enters London. Right, this is before the accounts that we had already told. So this is the first accounting with those claws, and they are the most credible of Jack's encounters. And it goes on to say, in other accounts, he tore the clothes from the backs of females. So again, that connection. And it ends with this maybe sarcastic remark, maybe insightful remark, depending on how you look at it. The article ends with, quote, not one of the injured people had been known to tell the story. Perhaps they didn't live to tell it. So, I mean, you can take it as like, they don't believe them or they're taking it seriously. Yeah, I think I, other examples of this I read too, where it sounded like they were saying, we don't know how many victims there are because some of them may not have lived to tell the tale. Yeah. That kind of thing. But yeah, again, here you have the Iron Claws, these activities that we would come to know as spring Hill Jack activities, but before spring Hill Jack enters London, he's still on the outskirts at this point, but these are the first whisperings of the concern outside of London that there's something lurking and then finally enters London proper and attacks Jane and Lucy, as we heard earlier. Yeah. And I thought what was really interesting about this is there's an article that mentions the details allegedly of that dare that these aristocrat fellows yeah, dared each other. I found this article. It was published uh, Saturday, January 20th, 1838. So right before the Jane attack that we first heard, but after the Lord Mayor reading that letter and kind of the pushback by the, the press. All oh, right. Yeah, there's pushback from the press. Obviously, they were being kind of called out. They weren't doing anything. But anyway, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, the details of the dare, I think, are kind of funny because of how preposterous. I mean, if it's true, it's very insidious. So basically, the bet between these alleged aristocrat young men, gang of aristocrats, the object of the bet was for these villains to destroy the lives of not less than 30 human beings. Jeez. Yeah. It's a little much. Uh, specifically, eight old bachelors. This is very uh, specific. This reminds me of like some sort of skull and bones. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, eight old bachelors, ten old maids, and six ladies' maids, and as many servant girls as they can, by depriving them of their reason and otherwise accelerating their deaths. Jeez. What a bizarre... Now, again, <laughs> and this is information that came from a Mr. Hobbler. Mm -hmm. uh, Never trust a Hobbler. Who wrote the editor of The Sun and was talking about this, quote, present crisis. But where he got his information about these, quote, vagabonds, was it just, you know, was he just not happy with the aristocracy and wanted to lay blame there? It's definitely possible. Yeah. 
So who knows? We, we can't know where he got this alleged information. But it is interesting that he, that in that letter, he noted the, quote, sudden appearance of one of these ruffians enveloped in a white sheet and blue fire. Yeah. Now, this is before Spring Hill Jack stories in London with the blue fire. So, enveloped? Like yeah. his whole countenance? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's been stories of uh, him like glowing effervescent or the ghost before he became Jack as we saw him in London, this kind of glowing effervescent appearance of the, of the suit or whatever they're wearing or huh. outfit. Weird technology. Yeah. Very that's, strange. It does seem like the technology to me. Well, I have a theory about time that. traveler. <laughs> it's not a time traveler. Theory. I don't, I don't think <laughs> I have a theory coming up when we get to the possible explanations. Um, I'm going to London with my time traveling machine and terrorizing a group of women. <laughs> that's what I'll do with my time yeah. and money. With my short life. I have a time machine. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. That's all I'm saying. But you know what's really interesting about Spring Hill Jack? If he was a person, he's probably dead now. That's true. Because people die. They do. Which reminds me, what, what's happening in the expansion? Allegedly they die. Oh, yes. In the expansion. Get ready, guys. This is going to be an exciting episode. Very intriguing, mind-bending episode. We're going to be getting into, uh, some of you may be familiar with, past life regression. Fascinating. Yeah, John is super into this stuff. Actually, it was his idea to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been working away. Hopefully, I... Uh, please him. I please him. Please, brother. Uh, but also, we're going to talk about what it's like to be taken into a past life regression. What does that mean? Is it real? Mm-hmm. Were you Spring Hill Jack? Were you Spring Hill Jack now? Um, how does it relate to the abduction phenomenon and that sort of regression? We're going to tell some compelling stories of people's experiences with evidence to back up their claims and also touch a little bit on pre-birth experiences. Which I think are always super interesting to talk about. Yeah, I think that stuff is all fascinating. So you definitely want to check this one out if you want to do a deep dive into the life beyond and before. I mean, what's more important than finding out where we come from? Yeah. So become an expansion member and find out. Awesome. If you don't know how to become an expansion member, go to beliefhold.com and click the big red button and it will take you to your glory. To Magic Town. Double the episodes of regular listeners and now ad free episodes. Yes. Check it out. Now here is a clip. Access granted. John McConnell, retired New York City policeman working as a security guard, stopped at an electronics store after work one night in 1992. He saw two men robbing the store and pulled out his pistol. Another thief behind a counter began shooting at him. John tried to shoot back, and even after he fell, he got up and shot again. He was shot six times. One of the bullets entered his back and sliced through his left lung, his heart, and the main pulmonary artery, the blood vessel that takes blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs to receive oxygen. He was rushed to the hospital, but did not survive. John had been close to his family and had frequently told one of his daughters, Doreen, no matter what, I'm always gonna take care of you. Five years after John died, his daughter Doreen, We're back. All right. That was a clip of the expansion episode, guys. Check it out at bluehole.com. Expansion. Expansion. (laughs) Big red button. All right, guys, back to Jack. Now, as I said, Jack did not exist in a vacuum. He appeared on the scene surrounding a tradition of these kinds of phantasmic encounters, these street side urban pranksters. Jack became kind of the original urban legend as he grew to his prominence in Victorian London, but in the outskirts. In places like Southampton and Hammersmith, there were reports. Yes. Roadside terrors of ghostly figures, apparitions. But these were not just apparitions. They were physical. And they had carried the attributes, some of the attributes that later would be applied to Jack, which begs the question, was this a potential origin for Jack, whether it be the person or the phantom, the figure that embodied Jack later, or was Jack part of a long line of this tradition, just carrying on in his own kind of mad inventor, supervillainy kind of way. I think the most important of these, these ghosts that were notably 
recorded back all the way back to 1803, 1804, and perhaps decades earlier, the Southampton ghost, um, who had the alleged attributes of performing extraordinary leaps, leaping over walls and buildings like Jack, allegedly. But I think even more importantly would be uh, the Hammersmith ghost. Yes. As far as a predecessor directly connecting to Jack. Yeah. And this is a tragic tale, the Hammersmith ghost. So let me lay it out for you. In 1804, the residents of Hammersmith, they were being repeatedly tormented by a tall white phantom. But the consequences of this spook allegedly were very severe. And two incidents in particular stand out in the histories. And these incidents brought the atmosphere of the village to a boiling point. The first, a pregnant woman walking by a cemetery at night sees what she describes as a tall white specter pull itself up from behind the tombstones. She's obviously terrified, takes off running, but this phantom catches up to her, grabs her and squeezes her, and she swoons, collapses in fright. She's pregnant. She gets home. According to the story, she doesn't live longer than two days. So she's terrified to death, I suppose. Which apparently was a thing at the time. Yeah. Well, according to the accounts, anyway. So this is one of the one of the important encounters or attacks, if you want to call them that. The second one, it was a wagoneer. Was that like a carriage driver? Yes, a carriage driver. A carriageman. Carriageman. <laughs> uh, he was driving a team of eight horses and 16 passengers out late at night one night in the village when this Hammersmith ghost jumped out, terrified him. He took off running leaving all the passengers and horses in a very dangerous situation. I imagine he was fired. But he claimed to see the same thing, a, a white, tall phantom specter that seemed supernatural, jumping out, leaping. And they believed at the time that this was a ghost of a suicide, someone who had slit their throat in the neighborhood just above where the Wagoneer had had this encounter. Oh. So okay. at this point, obviously, the, the town of Hammersmith is getting fed up. People start posting stakeouts, basically, at nighttime. They're going to the alleyways that they think the ghost had been seen or might be traveling through to, to go to these places to terrify people. But there's so many byways in Hammersmith that they keep missing him. This ghost keeps eluding people. And at one point, one man, Francis Smith, 29 years old, poor guy in a way, he's so angered and outraged by these assaults, you know, he's having some dire consequences, allegedly some women are dying from the fright, that he was going to go out and he was going to do his own stakeout and he was going to bring his shotgun. He's posted up along Black Lion Lane, and at some point in the evening, a white figure did appear, and it was coming straight toward him, when boom, he shot him. Unfortunately, when the gun smoke settled, it wasn't a ghost, as you might have guessed. Tragically, he mistakenly shot a man named Thomas Millwood, who was a bricklayer in white work attire. And this is a sad thing. At that time, Bricklayers wore outfits completely of white. And even, this is kind of interesting, the guy who he shot, Thomas Millwood, his wife had warned him leading up to this event because the town had been experiencing this, honey, maybe you should wear something else because you look like this specter that people are seeing around town. Yeah, allegedly his parents told him to wear like a big overcoat of some kind. Yeah. Because he'd been mistaken for the ghost <laughs> multiple occasions. Yeah, he'd already scared some people on accident. Yeah. So when this Francis guy shot him, it was at night. Uh, in a lane, I think it was like four yards wide or something, and there were hedges. It was hard to see. And didn't he call out to him? Yeah, well, he had uh, Francis Smith, the guy who was out there with a the shotgun, he had another buddy out there who was looking around the town as well, and they had a code word. They had a code phrase. So it was like, um, who comes there? And then the other guy would say, a friend. And then he would say, uh, come forward, friend. And that was like their passcode. <laughs> um, of course, this Poor bricklayer was like, huh? And he's like, boom. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. well, supposedly, sad. supposedly the bricklayer didn't respond. That was what yeah. Francis said in testimony, because this guy was tried for the shooting. Yeah. And the whole story is really fascinating. Yeah. We'll put links so you can read this whole story. You could do a whole deep dive. But in court testimony, he said, yeah, basically, like he called out to the guy and the guy didn't respond. And he felt like- Must be a ghost. He said he admitted that he acted rashly, but he was shooting a ghost that was causing these problems. And what's interesting was the jury went out and came back and found him guilty, but of manslaughter. Yeah, they felt really bad for him. They didn't convict him of murder. They empathized with the situation that he thought, because they didn't want to convict him of murder because it was, you know, if they convicted him of murder, he would have 
been hung, but they believed because he didn't believe he was killing a human yeah. that he shouldn't be hung for. And they empathized with him because they were all scared in the city yeah. of this ghost. But then the judge was like, just because you killed someone and you didn't mean to and you acted irrationally, that's not a defense for not murdering somebody. So you have to come back with either murder or completely innocent. Or acquittal. Or acquittal. But then the judge promised if you, if you come back with murder, which would have a death sentence, I will appeal to the crown immediately because his point was basically juries can't give mercy but the crown can huh. so the judge is like you say he's guilty of murder and then i'll tell the crown the crown will basically relieve him so what ends up happening is he gets sentenced to death and then he does actually tell the crown and the crown's like okay yeah he probably shouldn't be he gets pardoned he gets but pardoned. sad because he was trying to help you yeah, know? yeah. He, he... it's a dumb thing to do <laughs> but well, to sh- well when you're in that situation and everyone's scared i mean i do understand it yeah but yes, you should probably be pretty careful who you're shooting. Yeah. At. And even if it was, I think the judge's argument was also like, even if it was a ghost or a prankster, uh, at that point he hadn't caused any. Well, no, but real, it, according to the counts, he had, he had kind of unintentionally, maybe manslaughter, EE killed at least one woman of fright. Oh, the, that's right. Some of those alleged, but those weren't, he wasn't convicted of those things. These were kind of rumors. Well, of, they never caught him. You yeah. can't charge him. Anyways point is the crown intervened and he got a, what it was a year hard labor yeah something right. like that anyway sad story don't go shooting ghosts I think yeah that is the point it sounds like a song don't go sh- don't go <laughs> chasing waterfalls water ghosts that's terrible don't go shooting ghosts stick to the specters and the spooks that you're used to it sounds like a like a metaphor it does you know like you're sorry for girls don't go shoot your ghost sounds like you're talking about... <laughs> don't go shoot your ghost. Or what, what, what did you say? Don't, don't go, go shooting, shooting ghosts. ghosts. Yeah. It does. It sounds like don't go chasing... Oh, it's like tilting at windmills. Yeah. It, it sounds like don't go shooting ghosts means... Don't chase something that's not there. If I can finish <laughs> a thought, please. Almost like skeletons in, in the closet or, or something to do with that, where you're, you're lashing out something in your life that isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. Tilting at windmills. That's kind of what that phrase okay. means. Anyway. Don Quixote. But anyway, as I mentioned earlier, when John brought up uh, Jack the Ripper, and his, when he first came on scene, what was it, April or something of 1888? I don't know. You're always looking at me with these questions. Oh, we just, we talked about it earlier in the episode. It just randomly came oh. up because John asked about it. I just it. know it was in Whitechapel. But interestingly, I found a news clip. This comes from the Northampton Mercury from Saturday, January 28th, 1888. Mm. So I was looking to see if there were accounts in the newspaper of Spring Hill Jack reported in the future, and whether it's another fella or the immortal Count St. Germain, you know, Ooh. fitted with his eternal uh, soul sphere in his chest that's glowing blue flame and keeping him alive. His Tony Stark stone? Yeah, by the light of a candle. Or was it Jack the Ripper, <laughs> this figure here? Or was this example of Spring Hill Jack in the papers actually Jack the Ripper? That's what you made me think, John, when you brought that up, because this happened. Apparently, 1888, the same year that Jack the Ripper came on the scene. This comes from the Northampton Mercury, and it was titled in the paper, A Haunted Suburb. And this happens, of course, timely around Christmas. spring Hill Jack, after exercising the people of Liverpool for several months, seems to have come to London. Ever since Christmas, An individual, made up in a supernatural manner, has been exciting the inhabitants of College Park, near Kilburn, by midnight appearances, generally in lonely places, such as the road alongside the cemetery, or the fields having a few scattered houses. Women and children have been afraid of going out at night, while men and boys have sailed forth to track the offender, provided with lanterns and armed with sticks. A few nights ago, there was a great hue and cry raised. As it was reported, Jack had been traced to an empty house and someone was seen to escape from it. After which Jack has been laying quiet. Nevertheless, quite a scare prevails in the neighborhood in anticipation of his reappearance. The police have been applied, but they can do nothing at present as Jack mostly shows himself to women and children. Yeah. So that's interesting because that when you brought up Jack the Ripper and now realizing that that's the same year that Jack the Ripper came on scene, 
before he had a name, Jack Thurper, before he was ripping, I guess later in the year. I mean, I'm going to say that's, a. I mean, what's tying it together besides a made up name? Well, he's also attacking, kind of, kind yeah, of attacking. That's true. He's approaching, being. Oh, he's approaching. Well, he approaches. <laughs> Jack the Approacher. Jack the Approacher. He's envel- enveloping. Enveloping. He's- so he's been seen alongside cemeteries, roadsides. Uh, oh, women and children have been his victims, or he shows himself. So maybe this is him like approaching women at first in getting the nerve. Early to- eighteen eighty in January, before later in the year when he starts actually doing his ripping. Ah, uh, yeah. Does it coincide, though, with the date? Yeah, that year. Oh, wow, and I've never kinda, heard anyone make that connection. That is interesting. Yeah. Synchronistically, you met, brought that up, and I, the account I happened to find of Spring Hill Jack later in time was the same year that Jack the Ripper came out, but this took place right before. So did they... What happened to Jack the Ripper? They never found him. They never... So... Just like Spring Hill Jack. Earlier in this year, DNA evidence emerged that suggests we can identify the true identity of Jack the Ripper. A shawl found by the body of Catherine Eddowes that contains forensic stains has been used to identify the killer as Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old barber from Poland. But again, this is still a suggestion. I mean, if there's any truth to those aristocrat bet things, Uh and you think in those situations, it seems like they're pushing them to go further and further. Oh, right. And if you're an aristocrat where, you know, you just have experienced everything and you just probably look at humanity as peasants and it's a way to get a thrill and that thrill just keeps growing and yeah. you move to actual ripping. It reminds me of like a group of friends that dare each other to do something and there's one kid that just goes too far yeah. or is just a dark person mm-hmm. and you find out because he's just in that group getting pushed further and further. Although again, this was 50 years later, so they'd be very <laughs> old aristocrats <laughs> if it was the original, I mean, there's, there's, there's the original there's Jack. There's so many theories on Jack the Ripper that people have done deep, deep, research on exploring right was he you know was he a surgeon was he yeah, this is not very valid not valid news not valid news <laughs> yeah but it was just fun to say no no i think it's an interesting point and that timeline is weird that uh mm-hmm. not necessarily that spring hill jack was the same guy but just that there's this mention of spring hill jack this figure that they call spring hill jack the same year jack the Ripper shows up 50 years later after the original jack spring hill jack sightings hmm. so this could have been a sighting of jack the ripper that people just didn't connect i think that when it comes down to it, this time period was a dark time. Yeah. If only they had better help. Better help. This episode of Leafful is brought to you by Better Help. Yes, it is. I think holidays in general can be an emotional time. It brings up a lot of feelings from the past and... Oh, yeah. Regrets. Even family members, yeah. you know. I got some of those. Yeah, it can definitely be a challenging time for people missing friends and family, maybe, that aren't around anymore, that they're just not in touch with. Yeah. It can feel cold out there, but you can warm yourself up a little bit, I think. By talking to BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a great way to get started in therapy because there's no commitment. You don't have to drive anywhere. They have legit licensed therapists and it's totally at your own leisure and the way you want to contact them, which is cool. Yes. Send an email, chat, phone call, video, however you want to communicate. Yeah. Everybody struggles and everybody needs a little help sometimes. So don't be afraid to ask for help. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash BeliefHole today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash BeliefHole. And we thank BetterHelp for sponsoring the show. That's right. And we appreciate that because it keeps us going, going. Keeps the ship afloat. Okay, now we're going to get into the conjecture. Some of the fun conjecture about who this man, this phantom, this lady, perhaps, was. Oh, I thought it was a gentlemanly figure. Yes. How is that a female? There was one account where it seemed feminine at oh, first. Okay. I thought it was a lady. But whatever you think he might be, or it, if it was a phantom, uh, I certainly would say it's not an alien. Although well, that, that has been one of the conjectures. Yeah. Uh, around the time of, I think it was the 60s. Um, and Mike Dash made a great point about this in his paper that the UFO community or a specific writer, it was, I forget the name, Vire or something. But he had basically written in a popular magazine at the time. It was a fate. I think it was fate. I think it was like UFO Weekly or something. Basically suggesting that Jack had these kind of extraterrestrial abilities and the blue lights. And, but it also kind of invented some information and accounts that didn't necessarily happen or exaggerated stuff. So yeah, I, I don't think we have to jump to Alien just because we live in a time where that's kind of the zeitgeist mm-hmm. phenomena, you know? I don't think so. I think. Yeah, it doesn't strike me as a very plausible explanation. Then, of course, you have the demon, the imp, the phantasm, the spectral spirit, 
Um, I, I just feel like he is a mortal, a mortal, a mortal. That's my vibe. Yeah. Type figure. Um, although maybe a mad inventor or he had a friend who was really into, you know, in, inventing Inventing, yeah, yeah, like it's like a Batman sort of situation where he's got like a Alfred, right? Like, like an evil Alfred, yeah, like these aristocrat bros. But Alfred wasn't the inventor though, was he? Uh, huh? Didn't he? Have, yeah, didn't he? Well, I guess what, Mister Bruce, he had a connection at least. Well, there was the <laughs> who's the Morgan Freeman dude? Now I'm talking Christopher Nolan Batman, but the guy who worked for like the military department or used to and had would build oh, things. Yeah. Wasn't the butler? I feel like I remember Alfred giving Batman stuff though well he definitely we had yeah. to hand them it was his job he would oh, hand them yeah, i don't know i think he's a servant so he would hand deliver he was a suit. butler the primary inventor and fabricator of batman's technology according to most canonical sources is bruce wayne himself with occasional assistance from other characters such as lucius fox who is often portrayed as the head of wayne enterprises and the developer or provider of much of batman's advanced technology yeah. We do not know our Batman lore. It's another Batman <laughs> connection. He was one of these elites. He had a servant, Alfred. That's true. But he was more like a friend. Okay, so servant. <laughs> uh, we're, hold that thought, Chris, because I, I ran into some stuff. And of course, anyone who's listening to this now or hears some of the descriptions, you're going to be thinking what I was thinking, which is um, a perfect example of like a super, but maybe semi super villain. Uh, pre or super Marvel villain is real in real this life. This one was. <laughs> super villain's real. That's real. what's so funny. Yeah, man. what's the guy who runs that? Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos. No, no, the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who runs the the World Economic Forum. Oh, oh Klaus Schwab. Gosh. That is a real villain. That's a yeah. super villain. Yeah, he definitely is a real life super villain. So you just pick better outfits. I mean, you're you're telling people who you are. It is the Great Reset. <laughs> Grim Reaper cloaks from Mars. He wears. Um, but no, yeah. If you if you read the accounts, you hear the exact example of like a a super villain. So we'll we'll get into that. But I, I hear exactly what you're saying, Chris. I don't think it's a time traveler. I just think why well, not? Okay, what is your theory? He it's came pretty from the self-explanatory. Future? Yeah, you got future tech, right? It seems future techy. It doesn't really though, because it's steampunk. Exactly. No, but no, they didn't have these capabilities back what? in blue fire, huh? <laughs> leaping, <laughs> leaping tall buildings, leaping tall. Yes, yeah, springs. Springs. Everything. Although the argument against the springs is that where this occurred, especially in Hammersmith, the leaping is that the ground was very uneven. Well, if it would have been like steel or iron springs, like the. It would have to be a very hard surface to spring off of. It would have failed. So I don't think there were actual springs. It was more just a, a literary device to describe it leaping. I'm just going to go with Time Traveler. Well, what would it be then? A phantom? Or maybe a pulley system? That he what? He's mostly seen yeah. scaling walls. So it could have been like sucker, finger suckers. Finger suckers? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't uh, think they suction had cups. suction cups. Like plastic suction cups. <laughs> Cat burglars use them. I don't think they had plastic rubber bands. I mean, it, not to go back to the Batman thing again, to beat a bat to death, but grappling hook. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's another connection. There's a lot yeah. of Batman connections. You that is not really realistic, though. Why not? It would just be a spring-loaded uh, cord with a hook yeah. on the end. Could be. I mean, but don't wouldn't have to reel him up or something? Well, it might uh, have a... You could reel him up. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> what would power the reeling? I guess is yeah, the question. Yeah, I mean. Motors, bro. How does the motor run? On mind energy. <laughs> From the future. See, it's a time okay, travel. We're going to skip the I mean, time travel. I don't know. Your, your idea is. I mean. Girl, I, they're great. It is starting to. It, but we didn't even talk about the jumping in this episode. So that was a thing. Looking into these reports, the most identifiable reports of Spring Hill Jack. There's not a lot of springing going on. There's a yeah, lot of so I don't scampering. think we can really even include that that ideal into what we're trying to how we're trying to pin him down. Yeah, as an explanation. I mean, what we've got the blue flame coming out of the mouth or from the m mouth area. Yeah, from the facial. <laughs> this is like a dental zone. issue. <laughs> You've got a what we call a blue flame around the mouth area, <laughs> and then the red eyes from the helmet. Yeah, that is kind of weird though. The red eyes. I mean, they didn't have electric back then so i don't know what would power the red oh yeah maybe or some kind of contact lens yeah they had contact lenses back then. and then the next time he's like that was awful just, <laughs> that's why the next time he didn't have them because they were painful contact lens yeah wait a minute red right silicone silicone what about infrared right so you can see at night he's out at night infrared oh like a helmet yeah infrared <laughs> yeah it's pretty advanced we're going back to the time travel theory? yes <laughs> okay <laughs> uh this guy's hard to pin down. The red, so the red eyes, Jane, first one was the mm -hmm. red eyes? Jane Alsop. Yeah. But in Lucy's account, there weren't red eyes, as you pointed out. So the question was, yeah, was it something he was trying out that didn't work out very well? Or someone at the time, Officer Lee, maybe, who suggested if you hold a candle up to someone's eyes in that kind of 
hysteria that a lady might have. Oh boy. Uh, she might have yeah. seen a glow. Right. That's a probably what happened. Yeah. So basically we've got... Not because she's a lady. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying <laughs> an emotional trauma. Right. Things can be exaggerated. So really all we've got is the flame. And that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, but that's definitely within the realm of a human invention. No, no, right. no, no. no. You, yeah, well, human for sure. But don't forget, you got the metal... The claws. claws? The well, iron that's glove. not anything that unique. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting to that. So let's... So I wanna... basically it's just a crazy guy. From the future. <laughs> <laughs> so this brings me to my point. So I was looking at different stuff online. Uh, there's the, something called a gas mantle, which when I heard accounts of his suit becoming illuminated, it reminded me of the, me of the gas mantle, but that technology it would have had to be really souped up and safer because he basically would have been lighting himself on fire. What's a gas mantle? It was kind of like a lantern, a type of lantern, I believe. Oh, that's interesting. But again, it was like a quick burn and then it left a sh- this shell of Ooh. like a luminous... Like an envelopment? Exactly. Ooh. Like a luminous suit. Interesting. But it would, I think it just falls apart. It's very delicate. So I don't think that that would necessarily work. Was this from around then? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but it was for like a lantern, not a suit. But then this, this reminded me of... Johnny, remember looking at like HHO technology we talked about? Like the water car, hydrogen, oxygen, splitting the hydrogen and oxygen Vaguely. and H2O. I remember seeing a torch on a YouTube video a long time ago where they showed a flame from a hydrogen torch and how it didn't burn, but it was blue at night. And what's interesting is when Jane was attacked, Jane or Lucy, are, oh, if, get them confused, but they both were attacked with the blue spew out of his mouth, right? The fireballs, the blue flame, but they ne- neither were burned, but they were, the fl- fire went into their face. Mm-hmm. The one went, fell down in fits, right? Which almost sounds like more like a chemical thing. Um, I don't think the HHO the hydrogen explains it because it would burn after a certain amount of time. But then I remember there being reports of sulfur. Oh, really? What's interesting about sulfur is that I looked up... You mean the smell of sulfur? The reports of the smell? Yeah, the reports okay. of the smell of sulfur. At least when it was tied to other reports of like devilish creatures, right? Well, yeah. But interestingly, I looked up if you burn sulfur, which was available at the time, right? You get a blue flame. What is it? What color is the flame? And the interesting thing, this is really I'm interesting. I'm going to guess blue. No. When it burns particulates in the atmosphere, it's yellow. Yellow orange, I think. Yellow red. Chemists out there, let me know. But in a state, an atmosphere of pure oxygen. In other words, when sulfur burning is contained, like in maybe a chest lantern Ooh. of pure oxygen atmosphere with no uh, impurities, it will glow blue. It's <laughs> such a waste of time. Yeah. But the, so the, interestingly, after I was looking that up, I found a newspaper article where I think it was Policeman Lee who had said that uh, when he was trying to explain this away, he said, yeah, I don't think it's a phantom, essentially. He had allegedly he had witnessed experiments earlier in the day at some college or something where they had burned sulfur in test tubes and it glowed blue. And it made me think whatever his helmet is and the lantern thing, if he, when he brought the candle to his chest to ignite the sulfur, potentially, uh, if the sulfur when it was blown out through the helmet there was a tube kind of esophagus or whatever he had built in if it was just oxygen there just like in those experiments it would blow blue fire at least until it you know a certain point in the atmosphere where it might change color so i just found that really interesting so it would all be for the gag all for the fear yeah it's a brilliant uh exciting (laughs) uh, halloween trick but here is this will be in the show notes and if you're on youtube you can watch this i wanted to show this to you john I found a video of sulfur in pure oxygen in the state of his, of spring Jack's lantern and mask, potentially, where we saw these blue fireballs. This comes from a uh, chem toddler, and this is sulfur in pure oxygen. And so he's taking clump of sulfur, which I would assume would already be in his chest. And then in Jane's story, when he pulls the candle up to his chest, he would be doing this phase, which is igniting the sulfur. The sulfur catches on fire, and then he goes and puts it into a chamber of pure oxygen, which would be... I guess the mask or hmm. the journeying from the lantern container to the mask. And you get this. Oh, that's cool. Ooh, Whoa. Pretty. Definitely very sci fi superhero. Yeah, blue flame glowing almost like blue balls. Now you really know how to connect those nodes, Jeremy. I think we just solved the technology. <laughs> what the purpose of Look the whole that's thing? That's what a blue ball of fire that's true. contained in a glass. So. Yeah. Question is when he spew how does he spew it out and it remains blue? Right. Chemists out there let me know how that would be done, but <laughs> this is how it works. And that's the technology of Spring Hill Jack. But I, just, I thought it was really cool. Well, the blue flame kind of reminds me of just natural gas. Natural yeah. gas also can burn blue, but it would be very hot. Oh, your argument is that she wasn't burned, or the, the uh, victims weren't burned. So it had Could it be just because it wasn't close enough? 
Don't burst yeah. his blue bubble, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. But also the problem too is, uh, I mean, it could be either, honestly. Or some sort of flammable no, that's true. liquid could. Well, yeah, look at um, uh, Will the Wisp or. Um, ball lightning? Ball lightning or, or swamp gas. Swamp balls. Swamp balls. <laughs> nope, that's something else. <laughs> What are the balls of lights and swamps? Uh, we've talked about on the show many times. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're basically lights, swamp lights, Yeah, where they float around. And a lot of times they're blue or different colors, but this, I think it is types of gas, whether it's methane or natural gas potentially burning. But yeah, natural gas can burn blue. So it could be any kind of gas, really. Mm -hmm. I just thought sulfur was interesting because it was a powder that they had at the time. They were doing well, experiments was, at the time. if he wanted to be cool, he would have used that. Right. Otherwise, he'd have to have like a canister of natural gas that once ignited, it would go up immediately. I don't know. I like the, this seems more steampunky to have like the sulfur chemical. Mm -hmm. Also the, the fact that it, it's ignited below and then, and then comes up out through the helmet, I guess. Oh, so that's yeah. what it said. Well, so in Jane's story, he puts the candle to his breast, which is where this lantern was affixed to his chest, this thing in front of him. So this would be the container for whatever he was igniting. So oh, okay. that's why I was thinking it made sense with this powder because since it's coming out of his mouth, allegedly, or the front of the helmet. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Anyway, there's a lot of time yeah, on that. <laughs> it's hard to say with, uh, we're definitely not going to solve it. <laughs> yeah. Scant evidence from a hundred and some years ago. Yeah. This is all, I could, we could be completely wrong, but I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. It's no, cool it's tech. definitely an interesting story too. Oh yeah. And I wanted to mention this one last thing about the accounts of spring heeled Jack. And Jeremy, you picked this up from Mike Dash's research, but he made a really good point basically saying that the earlier accounts had the mention of the claws. And Mike points out that there's really no reason to doubt that he was using claws in those earlier periods. And this is an interesting quote, actually, um, basically pointing to the fact that there really isn't anything mentioned that makes the, the claws themselves some sort of alien or um, supernatural affect of spring -Hill Jack, but still points to the idea that he did, in fact, wear them, the original spring -Hill Jack, for whatever purposes, whether to cause mischief, terrify, or assault. And here's the quote. There is nothing in the evidence to suggest that spring -Hill Jack's claws or talons were anything other than specifically adapted gloves, as was suggested in the press in 1838. There is certainly no need to see anything supernatural or alien in them, though it does not seem unreasonable to suppose that they were designed to complement Jack's demonic appearance, as well as being dangerous and effective weapons. Finally, the fact that Jack seems to have worn claws only in 1838 is further evidence that the original spring -Hill Jack was not the same person or being as the Jack who bounded through the rest of the Victorian period, and that the original was considerably more sophisticated and better equipped than his successors. But now, Jer, are we going to talk about the trickster idea? Yes. All right, John, this last thing that I wanted to bring up to you is very important, specifically because I thought of you. Let's see if you can figure out why. So in the Yates Center Argus article I found online, these are all being linked in the show notes, October 2nd, 1884. This was, again, over 50 years after uh, the accounts we heard of Spring Hill Jack, but they're reflecting on it, saying it's been a century since, you know, the suburbs of London have been in this constant state of terror uh, and kind of recounting all these things. And what's really interesting, I found, was the similarity is something we talk about a lot. He goes on to say that among the escapades and the terror wrought in the town, quote, robbery was not the motive, for he was never known to take a single coin from his victims, even when fright had rendered them an easy prey, nor did he often practice any other degree of cruelty beyond scaring them. Ooh. Which, however, was quite sufficient, as in some instances, the sufferers never thoroughly recovered the stock of their nerves. A little hint here, John. <laughs> In the notes. The deadlights. Deadlights. Fear eater. I never recovered that shock of fear. 1837 at Barnes appeared the shape of a large white bull. The victims, quote, suffered most severely from the fright. So shape-shifting. At East Sheen, in the form of a white bear. At oh. Richmond, Richmond was aghast at the tales of women being, quote, frightened to death and of children being torn to pieces by him. Now, whether or not that aspect was true, these were part of the stories. And then later in Hampton, he was seen clad in armor of brass, yet another guise, with spring shoes and large claw-like gloves. Again, this is before the London sightings. But being hotly pursued, he scaled the walls of Bushy Park and vanished. 
At Hammersmith, he found a determined opponent in the shape of a valorous laundress. What? A uh, laundry lady. Yeah. Basically didn't back down, didn't show her fear. Oh, good for her. To whom he appeared in the form of an immense baboon, six feet high, with enormous eyes and arms of extensive length. <laughs> Yes, there it is. that's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> this is a shape-shifting trickster fear eater. He was doing everything he could to try to freak her out. Exactly. It doesn't remind you of like exposing yourself in all these different guises to these different people. You come as a, a knight with spring shoes and iron claws or uh, a baboon six feet high or a, white, or a bull. white bull chasing people down. Of course, they could just be costumes, although some of the feats that were reported seem difficult for a man to do. I'm saying Pennywise. Now, are these are these reports not some of the later fabricated ones? Uh, no, these were actually from the uh, account after the Lord Mayor letter we read. Okay, so there we get spring shoes. Yeah. There's at least one example. Okay, so the, the final point I wanted to make about this was the whole Batman thing. And we right. already talked about the Batman connection. But in the Penny Dreadfuls that came out in the, I think, the 50s, 1850s, 80s, they turned Jack into, instead of a guy who uses claws to clot women, they turn him into a guy who defends women. Yeah, he's the first anti-hero. They make him Batman. And just for a, a picture so you can see, this is a comparison, this will be in the show notes, of the Penny Dreadful from the 1800s on the left, which has spring Jack in the air with his cape extended, his white tights, tights essentially, and his black boots. Yeah, even the outfit's similar. And on the right is Batman, which came out in 1939. Yeah. So 100 years after uh, spring Jack, but I believe only maybe 30 years after the Penny Dreadfuls. Yeah. So 30 out. years after those were printed of Spring Hill Jack, you Definitely get some similarities there. Yeah, yeah for but sure. you never hear the connections. I just think it's interesting that there is that connection. And people have pointed out that like, it's kind of a loss after I looked into it, like obviously other people had put this together and people have pointed out that it's kind of sad that the cultural influence of like basically the superhero or the antihero or the villain, especially, uh, this connection was kind of lost. Mm -hmm. I think it's been rediscovered now though. Well, yeah, I think now because of the show. That's right. Anyways, Springhill Jack in the Penny Dreadful's name was Bertram Radon with a W. B W. Oh, Bruce, Bruce Wayne. Wayne. Weird. Yeah. Weirdies. I didn't hear anybody talk about that. That's interesting. But anyways, see, he has a secret layer. He has culture, an, cultural has subconscious. Inheritance. There's all kinds of things we don't have yeah. time to get into. But um, anyways, I just find that all fascinating. And uh, yeah. Cool. Anyways, Springhill Jack, who was he? What do you guys think? Let us know in the show notes. Very interesting. Yeah, if you heard the tale before, hopefully you heard some new, interesting information and concepts in this episode. I know I did. Yeah. Hope you guys dig it. Tons of uh, links in the show notes. Definitely check out the work of uh, Mike Dash, amazing researcher, and um, it'll all be in there. Check out all the newspaper articles you can read for yourself and get in there. Dig it. Yeah. And on that note, we have some special people to thank. Yeah. Superheroes of our own. Thank you, too. Here we go, here we go, here we go! Come on out of the hole and welcome to be here inside of us. Welcome to Jennifer Welch. All right, I would make a bet on her and I wouldn't Welch. Are you Excellent. in Orville? No one's going to get that reference. Welch's grape juice yes. and jams and jellies. What? Smuckers. That's, right? down that's the road. Smuckers. That's oh, not Welch's. Okay, well, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would make a betting joke. You know, you Welch on a bet. She's not going to Welch on us because she's a true supporter of the show. Thank yes. you, Jennifer. Jennifer Welch. Sean Upshaw. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes, Upshaw. Yes. What's the downshot out of that? What's the upshot? Upshot? Upshaw. Upshaw. That's the closest thing I could think. Okay. Welcome, Sean Upshaw. Welcome. Sorry we can't think of a better analogy. That's got a great name. ring. That, Sean Upshaw. No, it's very it's movie star-esque. Sean Upshaw. Have you had this new Sean Upshaw pie? That's not a good one. No. Sean Upshaw. Sounds like an action fighter. It sounds like you're telling someone to sit down and shut up. Sean Upshaw. <laughs> Anyways, moving along. Thank you so much to be here. Weird. Uh, Monique Angel Angeli. Bosaleil. Yes. <laughs> that was terrible, oh, Jeremy. So badly Jeremy, pronounced. retire yourself. Uh, Bosaleil. What is it? Monique Angelea? Busoleil. Ooh, that's pretty. Busoleil? Busoleil. Monique Angele Bosaleil. Awesome. Oh, sounds Italian. Bosaleil. What want to say it like that? It probably is. <laughs> that's, uh, well, that sounds Italian. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said it with a weird accent. <laughs> that's right. Welcome, Monique Angele Bosaleil. Mm. Uh, we're so happy to have you in the hole. And sorry about your name. I did terrible. Harry Dresden, hi. Welcome Ooh, to be here, Black Eyed Gold Kid. Yes! Welcome in, Harry Dresden. The Dresden Files. Mm -hmm. German. Uh, Kyler McDonald is a dogman whisperer, and he's tearing apart the belief. Oh, oh, Kyler. Kyler McDonald. Awesome. Ronald McDonald Club. Sure. Welcome to be here. Great reference, Chris. Sorry. Thanks for joining. Happy to have you in the hole. Antonio Pentejo. Ooh, or welcome. Pentejo. 
Antonio. Pantyhose. Pantyhose. <laughs> Pantyhose. <laughs> Pantyhose. <laughs> so bad. Oh, Antonio, we're, we're just having fun with you. We're blessed to have you. We are. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for being here. Uh, Aubrey Kirby Ooh. is my favorite of the vacuum cleaner sales ladies. That's a pretty name. I worked for the Kirbys. Do you think she's related? No. Okay. She could be. They make a great vacuum. They do. A little expensive. She's a Dogman Whisperer. Nice. She can afford to be a Dogman Whisperer. She it's may possible. be part of the uh, Kirby. The Kirby Dynasty. Dynasty. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Welcome in, Aubrey. Thank you for being a Dogman Whisperer. You are a freaking hero. Jesus Salazar or Jesus. Probably Jesus. Well, some yes. people say Jesus. That's true. Jesus, Jesus Salazar. Either way, you're uh, my friend. Mr. Salazar, welcome to the hole. Yes. Our Lord and Savior. Uh, Krista Worthen is a Dogman Whisperer. Yes. Mm. Ooh, Candy. Are you Worthen of the hole? I think she is because uh, she's here. Krista's here as a Dogman Whisperer. And we appreciate that. Welcome in. Ooh, another Dogman Whisperer right in that whale all the way into the sea is Doug Hoopenbecker. Ooh. I said it like that because I thought it was Humpenbacker. That's why you made the real whale reference. But it's Hoopenback, Hoopenbacker. I like it. Doug, dog and whisper, fist bump. Yes. Nice, Doug. Welcome yes, in. Yes, You're yes. the man. Uh, Winne Wemag Wemagwas say Wemagways. Winne Wemagways. What's the first name? Winnie. Winne. Oh, Winne. W i n n a y. Oh, Winne. Or Winne, yeah. And then. Spelling it out for everyone. W E M I G W A S E. Wemagwasi, it's probably. Wemagwasi, yes. Ah, Wene Wemagwasi. What an interesting name. Beautiful name. Welcome to be here. Welcome to have you in the hole. Thank you so much. Yes. You are awesome. Nick Davis, hi. Yes. Hi, Nick. Didn't think I'd see you around these parts. Yes, yes. <laughs> Get in here. Welcome to the hole. Splash. Nicholas, welcome. Yes. William Smart is oh. a dogman whisperer. Ouch. That hurt. Intelligent choice. Smarts. Mm hmm. Smarts. He went that way, huh? Welcome in, William. Welcome, William. Welcome to be here, Dogman Whisperer. Colin is a Dogman Whisperer. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Colin. We love you. Thank you to be here. Uh, Rachel Justice. Yes. yes. That sounds like another thing. <laughs> Rachel Justice. <laughs> uh, Rachel Justice. <laughs> Hi, Dogman Whisperer. How it up? Becky Martin. Awesome. All right. Becky Martin, I'll wear her shoes all day. Ricky Martin's sister. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pitch perfect. <laughs> She's a Dogman Whisperer as well, Becky. Nice. Thank you so much. Ricky Martin's sister. <laughs> That's a great song. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dogman Whisperer, Becky. Uh, Diana Walsh is here. Hi. Ooh, yes. Hello, Diana. Welcome to be here, you black eyed cool kid. Yes, Are you? Yes. Maybe she's related to Barbara Walsh. Maybe. Who's Barbara Walsh? I was thinking Barbara Walters. You were. <laughs> you shouldn't have. Well, they probably stood next to each other in high school. Corey. They had lockers next Corey, to each other. Corey, you're, you're, <laughs> you're ruining an entire you're industry. You're ruining an entire industry, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that there are people that were the people that did this that are still working They're still out there and they're some of the richest most powerful people in this business And they, are and they do not want me saying what I'm saying right now and sunglasses are an entire industry. She was such a jerk. Get out of here you old bag. Rest in peace. <laughs> bye bye He's Barbara. Like, Barbara the pizza dudes here. <laughs> we got the pizza dude coming uh, Who we're we talking about Diana Walsh. Thank you. Yes. Diana. Thank you. Diana. Diana. You were awesome. Monica Arce Sanchez is here. Ooh, yes. Monica. Monica Arce Sanchez. Sanchez in it up. Yes. Welcome to be here. Yes. Uh, Quinn Meredith is tearing through the hole. I need to think of more, more ways to say that they're a dog man. Yeah. I like that. But Quinn is a dog man whisperer. Nice. Which makes Quinn awesome. Thank you. Welcome, Quinn, the medicine person. Anna Halros. Ooh, that's Anna. a pretty name. I love that name. Welcome in, Anna. Welcome in, you dog man whisperer. Just tearing up the tracks. First choice on the first names for women. Yes, perfect choice. Uh, Joshua White is here. Yes, Hello, yes, Joshua. Yes, yes. Ooh, my favorite color. Yes, the best race. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was a joke for people who don't get it. What, white? This, Chris said the best race. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> don't be leaving that <laughs> Where in. Where were you a second you ago? You can't take that out, though. No, Why? it's staying in now. I can't. No, people yes. People know you're joking. People have okay, a... Okay, well... It's on you. People have a, a funny bone. We're going to be on like the headlines tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Our spot, Hello Fresh is going to be like, ah, oh, this is a bad move. <laughs> Welcome in. Joshua. Is Josh? Joshua White. Joshua White. Welcome to be here. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite birds to grace the parking lots and eat my French fries. Will Gall is here. Yes. Yes. Never kill a seabird. I say I sparred with the gull. It's bad luck to kill a seabird. We'll never spar with you, Will. Welcome, Will Gall. Welcome in. And go see that movie if you haven't. Lighthouse. Oh, it's so good. Uh, Garrett Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> Crack that bat. Garrett Nolan is here. Will Gall was a dogman whisperer, by the way, I should say. Thank nice. You, Will. Dogman. And dogman. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be sure. the new one. <laughs> so, it sounds like a seagull calling out. 
calling out the dog man. Dog man! <laughs> hey, dog man! Hey, dog man! Welcome to the hole! John, you want to welcome the new dog man with that voice? Want to come in? Jolly Llama is here as a dog yes. man whisperer. Yes! Dog man! <laughs> <laughs> no more howls. I just have a little button that I push. Just a little, like, kid from Brooklyn. Oh, I get <laughs> it. Dog man. Jolly Llama. Dolly Llama, but Jolly. Oh, that's fun. I like it. That's fun. That's a good visual. Jolly Llama. Thank you, Jolly Llama. You are awesome. Welcome to be here. Dogman Whisperer. Yes. Dogman! <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We're so happy to have all you guys in the hole supporting the show and keeping us going. And we'll growing. see you over on the expansion. Yes. And uh, until, until next, next time, time, we'll see you next time on, on Belief, Belief Hole. hole.